thank you, Musa, and uh, to the in entire foundation. Uh, they made organizing this show a, a, a real pleasure. They not only know the work, they love it to the degree that they really embraced uh, this rather sort of focused exhibition. For some decades now, this has been described as a kind of, quote, transitional period. And it doesn't really make any sense to me that you would describe uh, 10 years, a decade in the master's life, uh, time from his 50s to his 60s, when he was at, at not only extraordinary uh, acclaim among his own generation of artists, uh, De Kooning, Klein, uh, Pollock, uh, Still, but was in fact for many of the quote younger generation of New York school painters, Joan Mitchell, uh, Cy Twombly, a full 10, 15 years younger uh, than, than Gustin, a way forward with abstraction. Gustin knew exactly what he had set out for himself. And it wasn't, I should say, by choice, an easy road. He, 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 he was somebody who really, in a sense, kind of both relished new beginnings, stepping outside of himself, and then getting lost in, 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 in the paintings uh, them, themselves. It both begins and ends with Gustin's own demarcations. Uh, as, as I said, he, he had this ability to kind of uh, push back on his own history, uh, push back on his own success, uh, push back on both, in, in a way, both the critical and uh, uh, commercial success uh, that he had achieved uh, uh, remarkably. Uh, in, in the 50s, uh, the first half of the 50s, uh, to a, a degree that maybe isn't even fully recognized today, and the burden of that success. And it wasn't as a, quote, abstract expressionist, a term nobody was ever that comfortable with. It wasn't even, in a way, as a, quote, New York school painter, which is so broad and nebulous as to be something that most people were comfortable with. But it was the relationship between nature and abstraction and the extraordinary uh, uh, value uh, that had in identifying a, a, a new sort of second phase of the New York School painters. In fact, the term that, in a sense, circled around Gustin was something that he, he loved. Maybe it was a kind of monkey or that, you know, anything when it sticks has a tendency to sort of pin you down, to tie you down. But abstract impressionism just seemed too light, too ethereal, uh, too much about, in a sense, the transitory effects of painting and not, uh, uh, it didn't have the, the weight, uh, the gravitas, and maybe in the sense, the artist's own self-representation, which I'll, I'll get into. But in fact, exhibitions, major shows at the Whitney Museum, uh, the Guggenheim, uh, group exhibitions, dealing with, quote, nature and abstraction or abstract impressionism, by the point in time when these, quote, museums were recognizing uh, the differences between painting in the first half and the second half of the 50s, Gustin had all but pushed it away and abandoned it. And abandoned, in a sense, the great acclaim that this uh, exceptional show in uh, the first half of the 50s at the Sidney Janis Gallery had had. And it's likely that he could have gone on, not just for years, but maybe decades, in this kind of subtle and nuanced language 
But as Gustin had done both before, and as we know he did later, at that point when he seems to have the greatest command, and he has the most, in a sense, authority, it becomes too much about that and not enough about really new painting. You wouldn't have known it from meeting this very international, worked in Rome, very much a part of the New York scene, that his beginnings in Los Angeles would ultimately put him at the center of a, a kind of very changing art world. How both Pollock and he came out of the same high school, Emmanuel Arts, and were actually friends at that time. And the road that he took, Gustin took, in some ways not unlike Pollock and his journey towards Thomas Hart Benton and a kind of real social realism in the case of Gustin going to Mexico, working with Cicleros. But also, we seem to, we think of Mexico simply as the muralist, Rivera, Cicleros, Velasco. But in fact, it was certainly one of the beginning points of New York abstract expressionism and the convergence of artists such as Milton Avery, Robert Motherwell, Breton, Lafredo Lamb, made Mexico something far more international. In fact, abstract surrealism and its beginnings in abstract expressionism and, 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 and that, that, that painterliness was something that was not just in the air in New York, but was part of a changing language that had implications on the West Coast with artists such in the Bay Area, such as Clifford Still, Mark Rothko, Gorky, who were all very visible there, aforementioned Los Angeles, and then Mexico City. By the time he had returned from Rome, after having win, won the Prix de Rome, extraordinary prestige, he began his first period of abstractions where he immediately began to question both the nature of the representation of landscape and a kind of self-portraiture. Being a painter like Gustin is a journey. And you can see it from, in a way, the titles that he makes, Traveler. See it again. That focus on both himself and the process of painting is the reason, no doubt, he chose during this period to do a whole series of works called Painter, of which this, this is the first work, 1959. And it's absolutely clear he's already identifying himself having moved away from a, a, a more organic, natural landscape into something that is both a, a self-representation and a representation of the act of painting itself. He was, as he described it, resistant of forms losing their identities. And in fact, between painting, abstraction, and a representation self-representation, figuration of, of, of a sort, he was seeking, as he describes it, almost a state of inertia. He needed to create more solid forms. And in that sense, the creation of these forms 
is really the subject of this entire exhibition. And in a way, as you'll see through the trajectory of the show, he begins with these, this search for this, these more, quote, solid forms. And his concern that the loss of the object, you know, whether it's a still life or a person, was catastrophic for abstraction and the New York school. He was searching to reintroduce a sense of both the figure, the object, and creating this very complex space that built on the 20th century tradition of the pressure between figure and ground. Travelers, the path, we see here, alchemists. They're all about the journey of the artists themselves and the kind of magic, that kind of ethereal space where there is nothing, in a sense, purely represented, and yet one can see both oneself the history of its own making, and I think for Gustin, the history of himself as a painter. He kind of both pushed back against it, as I said earlier, and then carried it forward, both as a memory and a loss. Frank O'Hara, the great friend, advocate of the New York School painters, the poet, said it in a rather beautiful way. He says, the psychological ambiguities of the body's equilibrium on Earth. And that sounds kind of both mythic, but in fact, as an alchemist, the painter himself is, is, is really trying to find that place where the equilibrium is unstable, imbalanced. There is no sense of security. Uh, that lack of comfort, in fact, makes you both free and constrained. And uh, the word free is something that Gustin often wrestled with. Free was, you know, a blank canvas, but it was ultimately a, an enormous constraint. In fact, what he loved about these representations, painter, the alchemist, the figure, was a kind of unfreedom. The unfreedom that comes from an artist who loves the history of art, who's looking at Piero della Francesco as much as he's talking with Bill de Kooning. That unfreedom is the freedom of being able to reject and embrace the past. In the beginning, you're free. When you face the white canvas, you're free. And it's the most anguishing state. That state of inertia, that anguishing state, maybe this is one of the great legacies that Gustin provides for the next generations of artists. You know, one of the real important facts of this exhibition at this time is how little we appreciate at this moment in time the sincere hard-fought battle that's occurring in studios today by younger artists approaching abstraction both from 
a new generation, and in fact, both embracing the history of a much slower, hardened abstraction that is represented by dust, and this more synthetic, fast, uh, highly manipulative computer generation abstraction. Uh, we are kind of a little cruel as critics and curators and collectors. If we sort of dump everybody into the same basket, and you somehow say there's no difference between what's been described in various presses, zombie abstraction, and an extraordinary generation that's picking up the legacies of Gustin, Polka, Basilitz, and you can see where Polka and Basilitz both looked at and knew what Gustin was doing, and the whole nature of the battle between creation and destruction. You create an image, you erase the image. You build it up, you strip it away. You make it represent something, and then you make it only about the fact of painting itself. And I think that is really where we go next into these last two painting galleries, which for Gustin was playing this out and maybe taking it farther than people even today recognize. Gustin, by the time these works were made, was uh, among the most uh, uh, appreciated artists internationally. I, not only had he had uh, major exhibitions in uh, New York galleries, and the, the subject, I should say, the point around which two major group exhibitions dealing with abstraction and the fleeting effects of light, nature, but he was included in Venice Biennale, Documenta, San Paolo. That kind of success, as I said earlier, is something that most, most artists who don't really believe in themselves get trapped and held by. They, they follow the lead of their own success. And I'm not at all certain whether Gustin sat down and in any way wanted to systematically weave together two of the most significant strains of 50s and abstraction, both gestural abstraction and field painting, as you see here. But certainly, he wanted to own back for himself that relationship between mark-making, gesture, painterliness, and immersive field-like quality. Clearly, he understood that a generation that was emerging in the later half of the 50s were focused to the point of sort of like, this is the only new way forward of staining color directly into the canvas. Working with circles, lines, stripes, as Gustin described them. Circles, maybe they're targets, as he described them. And in fact, how field painting, the field painting of Still, of Rothko, was being, in a sense, rewritten into the history for a younger generation that said there was this inevitable march, as Greenberg put it, towards flatness, towards the ink being directly into the canvas. And while these works 
unstretched canvases directly on the wall, broad borders around them that, in fact, as he put it, and it's absolutely true, you see it in the works of the early 50s, he wasn't that concerned with the edge. But the relationship between the paint and, and the edge is his own way of sort of stamping down and saying, no, 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 there is another way forward. And it's not about a pure abstraction. And it's not the inevitable march that paint then becomes something that sinks into the canvas, that's that, that flatness itself. In fact, Gustin's search for depth on this pictorial surface is even more clearly stated in these works than almost any other. And the relationship between these forms, the painter himself, and this may be among the most descriptive with a portrait, an arm, maybe even a paintbrush, that he's, he's both in the picture, it is a representation. These groups, these people, these heads, they all emphasize this rather both very special and I think very important and underappreciated reconciliation of gesture and field painting. You know, at the time when he did this, in America's fascination forever with what is new and next, the dialogue had moved on. And he was left there with his generation and a younger generation and maybe quite successfully, Mitchell goes off to France. Twombly is in Rome. Gustin goes to Woodstock. Yeah. He was always ahead of his time. <laughs> and he found in Woodstock the space he needed from the New York School, but close enough that he was very much still a, quote, New York School painter. These are among the very last paintings done by Gustin before the break, an almost childlike reverie, as he described it in the, quote, pure drawings. And where, as he described it, and I don't see it to such a degree today as I think the world saw it then, the elimination of color. I, I didn't cherry pick the color ones. In fact, this is a very fair representation of this period. And with the exception of this one work, which in a way became the focal point of his, quote, elimination of, of color. It also very much like the way Gustin both pushes away and then embraces by eliminating or painting over color, by taking black and painting it over with white to erase the black, to erase the color, he was able, by his own choice, to use the words that he had pushed away for almost 15 years. He was able to talk about light again. He was able to talk about, in a way, nature. Not the light of the Impressionist, not even the light of his works of the early 50s, but a light that comes out of a 60-year-old man who spent a lifetime in a studio trying to find his own 
his own life. There was an extraordinary, I think, pleasure, as he described it, in these works. He had finally succeeded in getting lost in the painting. So as he put it earlier, he didn't have to step back and smoke a cigarette, look at it, and then move on. In fact, gray, this cloud of smoke, became one long, rather kind of magical haze. And you can think of people like Turner and his move into abstraction. The atmosphere of a heavy kind of marine layer, the water coming up off the Hudson Valley, the history of American luminous painting, and their both representation of nature and people, threes, twos, as he described them. It's very clear that in some ways these are the things he loved the most and the things that challenged him the most. At the time of the retrospective at the Guggenheim, it was almost canceled by Gustav. And that's a, not an untypical move. You sort of zig when you should zag, but he, he finally let the show happen. because of what it would do for him as a painter. And it would allow him, in some ways, to distance himself. Certainly, retrospectives do that for an artist. Stop painting and begin a whole new chapter, like the last piece a new chapter in his life. And that new chapter is the last gallery and the drawings, which, like this exhibition of his abstractions, is the largest representation. Between 1966 and 68, as so I said, the period right after the retrospective, started a series of pure, pure drawings. No color, gestures and marks that move obviously into the representations of both imagery, portraiture, architecture, landscape, and then do so in a way that was kind of extraordinarily liberating. How do you make a retrospective not pin you down, but to free you? You put all the pain, all the skill, all the accumulated knowledge that we all got to see away, and you start with a clean sheet of paper, and you stay, as he did, kind of fresh every day. You know, you'd wake up, no doubt, in the morning, and it was just, this was his, his life, this was his job, this was his passion, and he didn't want the encumberments of who he was to not allow him to move forward as a painter. These drawings did so. I first and only time met Gustin very briefly, right at the time of his David McKee exhibition of the first of these, uh, first of the McKee exhibitions of the figurative work in the 70s, mid 70s. Uh, huge lover of Gustin's work, 
both Norman Bloom and Joan Mitchell had heard about this show, knew it was happening, told me I had to go see it. I showed up a few hours before the opening, and Gustin, sitting on a, on a bench, I introduced myself. He was pleasantly surprised that I, a young curator recognized him. And I said something like, because well, why are you here? How did you know about this? You know, like, what do I mean? Somebody in their 60s to somebody in their 20s. And I had said that both Mitchell and uh, Bloom had encouraged me to go see the work. And frankly, they're really upset with you. I mean, they saw you as the last great stalwart of abstraction. What are you doing moving over to what was like, for them, some kind of pop enemy camp. Well, Gus, charming, good looking, kind of gruff, got, got a smile on his face and he goes, well, if you think they're upset, you should have heard what the muralist had to say about me when I became an abstract painter. And in fact, that story, which repeats itself, is, an, is one of the rich, and one could say almost postmodernist approaches to art making. That business of throwing yourself in, and then stepping back and making a kind of turn that is ultimately driven by the painter and his imagination. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy the exhibition.